Uh, welcome, everybody. It's my pleasure to welcome you to this latest CIMR event. It's part of CIMR's commitment to equality, diversity, inclusion through our practices of engaged scholarship, which Monda Ram has just described as being sustained and continuous interaction with researchers and practitioners. So we have a broad church in the CIMR, so we, we engage with broader audiences, and this is part of our activity to, to make things happen. So it's all very well to have debates, it's, but it's also important to see how we can take things forward. And this is part of this commitment to taking things forward. So we have an excellent panel today. Um, this is continuation of the research that was funded by the Regional Studies Association in, in 2020 and, and subsequently supported by the BEI School. And that was about what kinds of support are needed for uh, disabled entrepreneurs and entrepreneurs from uh, different um, eth ethnicities. So I spoke to 60 odd entrepreneurs, business people and policymakers. Uh, my conversations included Jacqueline, uh, who's, who's joined today, and Thomas and Nigel. And through Jacqueline, I, I met David and, and now Joanne. So, so thank you all. For, thank you to the chairs and thank you for the speakers. So one of the questions I asked uh, the networks, particularly and the entrepreneurs, is do you work with universities? If so, what kind of support do they give you? And so I did a, a brief report on that, which is available. But this is, this is the theme today, to celebrate what universities are already doing and to explore what some of the other endless possibilities might be. Well, I shall stop there and hand over to Jacqueline and David. So. Thank you again, and thank you, Isabel, for organising all of this. Well, Jacqueline, I think you're on mute. You just need to unmute yourself. Apologies for having a little problems with the mute button on my computer at the moment, so we'll see. We'll see if we can do that a little bit better. So welcome everybody. I'm going to co-chair this session with my colleague, David Walsh. And I'm going to start the session um, before we introduce our panel with a little bit of background to, um, I suppose, aid our discussion. Because what we're going to talk about initially is the perspective from the network, from the inclusive entrepreneurship side of this, and that we hope will help you in your determinations as we go through the session. So I was asked basically to, um, I was like, set the scene, look at the um, entrepreneur network that I founded, the APPG, and my view on the new hybrid ways of working within inclusive entrepreneurship, particularly in relation to working with universities. So one of the things that I'm most often asked is what do we mean when we talk about inclusive entrepreneurship? And I'm really clear on this. It's enterprise that's created by individuals who face barriers and those who support us to create inclusive economic growth. And at the onset of the pandemic, to be fair, our network was predominantly based in the real world. We didn't see beyond that, actually. Pre-pandemic, our engagement with universities was generally around facilitating workshops, being interviewed as part of research projects, all of which were undertaken in the real world. I'd experienced co-authoring with international academic institutions alongside Deed Rowell and worked briefly with Birkbeck CIMR and Lancaster University with the Health and Work Forum. The onset of the pandemic changed my whole business portfolio and particularly within the network, as we were faced with the prospect of losing our businesses during the first lockdown, alongside the broader impact on the sector as our voices were effectively silenced at this crucial time. In response to this, by the end of the first week, we placed everything, all our real world activities, on a digital platform. And we called this our Friday briefings. It gave people valuable updates on government responses to the pandemic and also ensured we were able to keep giving that valuable insight and recommendations to parliamentarians via social media. Our members reported that the move to the virtual world was invaluable both in terms of their mental health and well-being, but also reducing the impact on business disruption. 
As a direct result of our digital presence and reaching out to key stakeholders, we engage with universities on a new level as they joined us on our Friday briefings. And we in turn contributed to the content creation of the digital offer Burbeck CIMR and others were developing as they also responded to this new way of working. We collaborated on the digital sessions that they were creating in response to the devastating impact on universities and students. One of the most significant things to come from our digitalisation was the creation of the All Party Parliamentary Group for Inclusive Entrepreneurship in the UK, chaired by Dr Lisa Cameron. And universal inclusion is privileged with providing the Secretariat. And academics who we were collaborating with became active members of the APPG and the various work stream and task and finish groups. So to fast forward to where we are today, there's much debate relating to the pandemic. Its status in terms of are we in it or are we out of it? But as restrictions have been removed, we are definitely in the era of the new hybrid ways of working. And this is not just in relation to inclusive entrepreneurship, but the future of work in its entirety. In answer to how I view the new hybrid ways of working with an inclusive entrepreneurship, particularly in relation to universities, first of all, I suppose, what does that even mean? And technically, it's combining traditional working from home and office spaces. Something we can all agree on, I think, was completely turned on its head following the work from home directive. These new hybrid ways of working have created an era where the future of work really does come with endless possibilities, particularly for disabled entrepreneurs. Members welcome the increased collaboration with universities, the experience within this virtual world and the positive relationships developed that have continued into the new hybrid ways of working. And we are currently working on real world collaborative events with universities. All indications within our network so far and expressed within the APPG are that this is the preferred way in terms of balancing the fine act of having a disability and creating enterprise based on sound lived experience and a desire to engage in work that's good for your soul. There are some caveats to this, however. It has to be about personal choice, equity within the new hybrid ways of working across all aspects of enterprise, particularly relating to the access to work award, procurement, technology, access to markets, and of course, in respect of our debate today, in our engagement with universities, which has grown exponentially in such creative and positive ways during the pandemic. I'm looking forward to hearing, along with my co-chair, David Walsh, Fellow of King's College, what role universities will play in this new hybrid ways of creating inclusive entrepreneurship. Thank you. Thank you, Jacqueline, and uh, welcome to everyone. Uh, very nice to see you all here. Um, I think the panel is absolutely amazing in that we've got some great practitioners here who've, um, who are doing some very exciting things. So very much looking forward to, to hearing more about that. Just very quickly, I'm uh, one of my roles is as entrepreneur in residence at King's and actually higher edu education institutions, universities, they've become um, tra real trailblazers really actually in, in terms of actually building and creating accelerators and hubs and services for entrepreneurs. OK, we've got a great panel uh, today who are looking at that from also an inclusive entrepreneurship perspective. And I'd just like now to ask the panel to introduce themselves uh, to get the questions rolling. And perhaps I could ask uh, Nigel to go first. Thank you, Nigel. OK, hello. Um, I'll, I'll just say a few words about uh, the business clinic at Northumbria University, uh, which was started in 2013, so it's now in its ninth year of operation. And the purpose of the business clinic was to provide a, an experiential research rich learning experience and knowledge transfer opportunity for our undergraduate and postgraduate students. Um, we felt that we needed to try and help to improve the employability of our graduate, undergraduates and graduate, uh, postgraduates who hadn't necessarily had the opportunity to engage in internships or placements. We also felt that we had a, a, a right to sort of make a contribution in terms of civic responsibility in real connections 
with supporting the regional economy and the wider community. So they were the three driving forces of why in 2013 we started as a pilot project. The, and the business clinic is that sort of crucial part of the philosophy at the Northumbria University of providing a real experience, uh, uh, whether it be placement, study abroad, etc. But in terms of inclusion, we know that a lot of disadvantaged students from disadvantaged backgrounds and particularly international students find it particularly challenging to secure internships. So the business clinic uh, was really conceived as an, another vehicle to try and open up these opportunities. So both at undergraduate and master's level in the business school across all the major programmes, we offer as an alternative um, to a traditional dissertation at undergraduate level, 40 credit points, or at a master's level, 60 credit points, uh, in place of a dissertation, a consultancy uh, project uh, with a real client. And in the period between 2013 and 2021, some 2,000 students have gone through the business clinic supported by business clinic tutors, and we've advised something like 500 diverse organisations with a wide range of business problems. Uh, we ask the clients uh, on receipt of the report and presentation, what do they think they would have paid for that work uh, if they were going to a paid consultancy and on, on anonymous valuations, our pro bono value to date is 2.75 million. And that is before we actually go back and look at impact measurements, having implemented recommendations. To give you an idea of the scale of operation this year, 21-22, we're working with something like 100 clients um, and some 450 students working on live client projects, both at undergraduate and master's level. So that's a little brief introduction uh, to the business clinic. Thank you. Thank you, Nigel. That sounds really fascinating. You've got quite a head of steam up there with your uh, companies and, 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 and grad undergraduates and graduates involved, OK? Um, Joanne, joining us, I think, from uh, New York, are you? <laughs> uh, welcome. Um, would you like to introduce yourself? <laughs> sure. Uh, can you hear me? OK, great. Uh, I am Joanne Roll. I'm the dean of the School of Business at Megar Evers College, City University of New York. Uh, I came to the college in 2014, and in 2016, we offered a couple of conferences. We got funded. One was on corporate social uh, responsibility, and the other was on social entrepreneurship, both driven by the needs and the demands of both our students and our community. Uh, our college was evolved out of the need for social justice. I don't know if you know a little bit about our history, but in the, during the civil rights movement, Omega Evers College was one of the slain uh, civil rights leader, and those in our community wanted a college that was going to be dedicated to those there. A little bit more about uh, Omega Evers College. It is in Brooklyn, New York. Uh, Brooklyn is in the city of New York, one of the five boroughs, but what's unique and specific about Brooklyn is that it has the most Caribbeans in the world outside of the Caribbean. So it's a heavy concentration. And with that, we had a high concentration of entrepreneurial spirit, as much of that came from the uh, Caribbean. And so uh, in terms of our students, they come to us with an interest and a desire to give back to their community. So in terms of entrepreneurship, uh, they were very interested in social entrepreneurship and developing skill sets for that. So in 2016, uh, we launched the uh, on, uh, the Experiential Entrepreneurship Learning Lab, where students had opportunities to do several activities. One was a boot camp, and and now the boot camp was necessary because we believe that entrepreneurs can come from any discipline in any walk of life, but they have to be able to talk and speak the language of business 
business. So in that boot camp, we we trained uh, psychologists, uh, biologists, uh, and, and, and scientists all in the language of business. And to be quite candid, some of our best entrepreneurs came out of other schools and not necessarily the school of business. And once they went through that boot camp, we offered them the ability to study abroad. Many of our students were able to take trips uh, with some of our faculty to, I'd say, up to 10 to 11 countries. And the reason we wanted them to do that, they, we wanted them to know that business is global. Business is worldwide. And with the technology driving some of the platforms, they would be able to do business anywhere in the world, but they needed to understand the cultures. They needed to understand the differences and the similarities. And uh, the study abroad did some of that. And then we did pitch competitions. Many of our students, uh, first-generation college students, uh, their parents were business people, but not necessarily uh, college graduates. And so we taught them some skills in terms of presentation. We taught them skills in terms of writing for business and networking, networking in circles to help uh, uh, enlarge and leverage the businesses uh, that they uh, were developing. Uh, currently, you know, uh, since the pandemic, and, uh, and, and this, you know, I'll talk more about uh, some of, of that morphed into helping them even beyond being in the classroom, even beyond being with us. We have alumni who still look to us uh, for some support. And so uh, a lot of that work that we were doing, uh, the reason that we were doing, when I mentioned that we had two conferences, uh, they were global conferences. We had uh, faculty from Chile, Jamaica, Kenya. And when we've completed uh, our, our, our conference, we did not want that work to end. And so we started, we made a pact that we would research together and study together and help our students because the common bond that we had, I heard someone mention about uh, employability. You know, some of our students was doing everything we told them to do, good students, and still they had issues in the job market. And I, I won't go into some of those issues there, but here, but so we, we, we looked at job creation and, uh, and self-employability as a way for our students to get to the next level, even if some corporations in other places, and we're right there in New York, uh, in Wall Street and some of the heart of both the fashion district, the financial district. So, so we wanted them to be able to be able to make their contribution irrespective of some of the barriers in the labor market. And, and, and so that work continued into what we call the future of work and entrepreneurship for the underserved. Jacqueline mentioned earlier that she participated in an academic uh, presentation that led into a publication. The way it happened was we met Jacqueline at a conference and she was doing some other things. She bought that topic to us about inclusion of not just the minorities, not just women, because those were our topics those, that we were working on. But she said, how about this? And so we pivoted uh, in that moment, in that time, we listened, we learned, and then we did more research in the area, and that's how we were able uh, 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 to 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 work with her. Now I will tell you the status of where we are. We produce one volume of the Future of Work and Entrepreneurship for the Underserved. My colleagues from Kenya, Kenyatta University, and myself, we were the senior, uh, we were the editors, and and a a another publisher in the U.S. came to me afterwards and say, you know, it's not just about the future, but it's about sustainability and the future of work. And the, the pandemic caused us to think more about sustainability of our futures, not just helping our students to get that first job, because many of them, because of cultural issues and other things that they didn't understand, cycled out, but how to help them stay in those jobs or stay in those businesses that they created and leverage them to become businesses. Now I have talked six minutes and 35 seconds, and so I will let someone else go. I always put myself on a timer. <laughs> Joanne, I, I think that was the most passionate introduction mm. of anyone I've ever heard. OK, <laughs> and um, I feel like you're in the room with me. So so well done and look forward to your further thoughts. Um, Tom, over in Dublin, um, nice welcome. 
please introduce thank yourself. Thank you. Thank you very much, David. And uh, I'm not really sure I can follow that. Um, so look, I'm professor of entrepreneurship at Technological University Dublin. And the area I specialize in is minority and disadvantaged communities, um, entrepreneurship um, for those communities. And in 2006, uh, I founded the Institute for Minority Entrepreneurship within the university. And we, we work with immigrants, people with disability, um, Roma community. Uh, I've delivered training programs uh, inside prison. Also, we work with seniors, with women and uh, other uh, marginalized or disadvantaged groups in terms of entrepreneurial activity. In last year, I uh, edited a book which was published uh, called the Pal Palgrave Handbook of Minority Entrepreneurs. Uh, here's one I prepared earlier. Um, and I'll leave a link on that uh, in the chat room shortly. Uh, but basically what that is, it's a collection of uh, articles and, and, and chapters from leading experts across the world on all the topics around inclusive entrepreneurship and the different communities. Uh, also, I work with the OECD for the last eight years. I've been writing the country reports for Ireland for the Missing Entrepreneur series uh, in the last report that the OECD published on missing entrepreneurs. Uh, I co-authored the article on or the chapter on immigrant entrepreneurship. And I've also been on missions with the OECD um, relating to inclusive entrepreneurship. Uh, more recently, uh, I've designed and delivered a tailored online program on self-employment for people with disability. It was held between September and December of last year and we had 20 participants on that program. It was the first of its kind ever in Ireland and it filled the need which was that there, there is no tailored support available for people with disability in Ireland in terms of starting their own business. Now Ireland is not unique in that um, but it was an opportunity for us as a university to fill that gap. The good news is because of that pilot program and its success, uh, a national bank has agreed to fund a, a repeat of that program for the next three years, um, which is good news. In addition to that, because of its success, we've been asked to, to um, examine delivering programs for refugees. And also we are currently developing as part of an EU funded project, uh, a major program on self-employment for um, people in the prison system. And so lots of activity happening within the university targeted towards marginalized and disadvantaged communities um, relating to self-employment. Just before we move on, can I just say, I, I think you know this is a critical moment or an opportune moment for us to be having this discussion, because I think in terms of, of you know, what role does universities play in new hybrid ways of creating entrepreneurship. I believe there are six trends happening at the moment which supports this work. The first is that community engagement has become ever more important as part of the mission of universities. Um, indeed, we're involved in a big EU funded project in terms of developing community engagement within our own university, targeting disadvantaged communities. Secondly, within the university system, um, experiential learning has become much more important and both Nigel and Joanne have talked about students working with their communities and that's also a huge part of the trend of university education. For example, in, with my own entrepreneurship students, uh, they don't sit in an exam but instead in groups of three, they got to go out and raise money for charity and in the last number of years that we've been doing this, students have raised in excess of 800,000 uh, euro for various charities in Ireland. The other trend that's happening within the university system is the inclusion of universal design within the classroom. So it's not just about you know, hybrid ways of working in terms of create, uh, inclusive entrepreneurship externally, but it also needs to happen internally. And us as educators are now much more conscious of the materials that we, you know, how we present materials, 
but also who we bring into the classroom. So, for example, the role models that we bring in uh, would need, you know, are, certainly I would be much more conscious of the diversity of role models um, and that they're not just coming from one particular community or even uh, one particular gender, uh, as might have happened in the past. And so that diversity needs to be reflected in terms of role model and in terms of, of, of how we present our, our modules. The fourth trend that I think is happening is that missing entrepreneurs uh, or inclusive entrepreneurship is becoming a much more talked about topic. And I think this has been driven by the OECD reports that are published every two years. They recognize the, the huge untapped potential of these minority communities and, and the need for tailored support. This notion that enterprise agencies have that we treat everyone the same is utter nonsense because treating everyone the same is not actually the answer in this situation because people from minority and disadvantaged communities need uh, or sorry, have additional and distinctive challenges that need tailored support. The fifth uh, trend is remote working. And you know, the, the pandemic has shown us that the ability to work from any location is now possible. And, and that leads into the sixth trend, which I think is, you know, the improvements in terms of assistive technologies and, and the improvements in terms of you know, how we work and, and even in platforms such as Teams, which we're currently using. So I think all of those trends lead us to a time when it's converging that this is probably our moment to strike and that there is an environment that's developing and there's an interest that's growing. And I think it's incumbent upon us to seize that opportunity and to make change happen. Thank you. Thank you, Tom. That was a, that was a great pitch, <laughs> really. <laughs> Learned some fascinating things there and really, really powerful messages. Uh, thank you. Um, yeah, so just to say, uh, we're going to start the, the panel discussion now, and uh, you probably see there's a chat button uh, on your screen. OK, so if you've got any comments or thoughts or questions that you'd like to raise as we go through, then please do let us know, OK, through the chat. I'm now going to hand back to Jacqueline to kind of kick the, the Q&A off. OK, back to you, Jacqueline. Thank you very much, David. We knew with such a distinguished panel, the introductions were going to be lengthy. You all do such wonderful things. So I'm going to move quite swiftly to a, a relatively shorter question for you. Um, and I'm going to pose it to um, one, one of you initially and ask the others to comment following that response. So my question, um, and you, you touched on it slightly in the introductions, but we're really keen to, to sort of like I suppose share with our participants today that prior to the pandemic how were you actually engaging with your your students and other people you collaborated with when we're trying to kind of differentiate between the the real world and the virtual world and I'm going to start there please with Joanne uh, we can't uh, hear yeah. you. Yeah, I got it. I was trying to navigate to the Mac. Uh, we were 100% face to face. Um, on March 20th, uh, March 2020, we had done a big conference on the impact of uh, wealth creation, and and it had gone well. And the next day, literally, that was face to face. The next day, the university closed down, and so we had to very quickly learn how to pivot. And that was everyone from our faculty to our students to our staff. Um, I can't say that it was easy, uh, but we did it. And and we had a, an environment where uh, we were in step with our entrepreneurs around us face to face. Many of them had to learn how to present or, or develop a presence online remotely because there was no face to face anywhere. So, uh, you know, the, it, it showed us the perseverance, the resilience of not just the students, but the community to come together. Now, I will tell you in Brooklyn, 
Uh, not just in Brooklyn, in New York City, minority entrepreneurs took the heaviest hit in terms of closures uh, because they did not have the resources to stay open and uh, uh, to to stay operating until we reopen. So many of them closed. But the beauty is when they uh, evolved into their new self. They were different. They were more powerful. They had longer reaches. Before face to face in their retail businesses, they would only have the customers who could uh, geographically access them. Now they had new markets once they learned how to operate in an environment. So we learned together as a community. Uh, some did not come back, but some came back bigger and better. And so I'll stop there. Thank you very much, Joanne. I mean, I, I remember that so well. We nearly inserted a pic, I might have actually put a picture in the blog of the first time we did a Zoom call and literally it was like two lamps, a chessboard and, and everybody around the world was all kind of creatively innovating to do these things. It was wonderful to see. Nigel, could you please respond to that as well? Yes, thank you. Um, well, very similar to Joanne in the sense that all hours was face to face and um, yeah, not not very little done virtually, very little. Um, in terms of inclusion, uh, we very much worked with a diverse range of organisations from some multinationals like Procter & Gamble and Arriva, but a lot of our work was with social enterprises and charities. Um, and particularly, we were engaging with the external community to try and address the disadvantaged or those hard to reach individuals who have particular challenges. So, for example, we work closely with the autistic entrepreneurs um, with, with various projects we did. We work closely also with the Asian Business Networking Community, which was involved as hosting events and bringing together clients and working on projects to try and improve inclusion and diversity. For example, uh, we were involved in a project with Fire and Rescue Service to try and improve the diversity of uh, fire and rescue workers who are predominantly in the northeast, white, male, uh, and not representative of the community at all. Another project we're involved with is, is in National Gardens, where we're trying to encourage the diversity of gardens that are open to the public, but also in terms of the diversity of people who actually go to those gardens to better reflect uh, the community in its wider nature. So that's, but basically, everything was done face-to-face uh, -face prior to the pandemic. Thank you, thank you. I, it's just so incredible what was, what's going on around the world, it really is. And Tom, could you please come in on that now? Yes, uh, just before answering, can I, I just want to make one quick comment. It was something that Joanne said that triggered this thought. Um, the experience in Ireland, and I believe more internationally, has been that minority and disadvantaged communities have been disproportionately affected by unemployment due to the pandemic. And, and what we know from the economic crash of 2008 to 2012 is that people who were made unemployed from these communities took longer to get back into the labour market afterwards. Um, and I think that's another really good reason why we're having this discussion and why we need to identify self-employment as a as an alternative option in terms of labour market activation for the future for the, for these communities. In, in terms of our own work pre-pandemic, um, as mentioned, um, in 2006 we had started the Institute for Minority Entrepreneurship and we're quite proactive in that area. Um, and indeed we were looking to move into online activity. Uh, in 2016 I did a TEDx talk uh, around self-employment for people with disability, where I argued for online learning. I think the change that has happened significantly is that the audiences are no more receptive to online learning. Okay, Because in the past, what the challenge was not so much that we, you know, that we didn't want to do it because we, we were looking for to reach out to people in different ways. The challenge was people felt we need to be in the room together. We need that interaction in person. We need to build the networks because it only happens if you're in the room. And now what we find is we say, for example, on the disability program, I, I created a WhatsApp group, which is just you know, flying, right? So the, the network is happening you know, through those means. Um, so what I would say, Jacqueline, in terms of the question is that 
the desire was there, the activity was there, but the audience is no more receptive, receptive because everyone now just takes it as the norm. I think that's that's really interesting from all of the panelists because certainly um, what we saw in the network was suddenly this everybody was looking to connect and at that point the only way was the digital way and it was an it was an incredible I think moment in time of that complete devastation but also that human spirit in wanting to somehow connect on that humanitarian level so thank you so much and I'm going to hand over to David now for the next question. Yeah, thank you, Jacqueline. No, it's fascinating hearing your response. And one, one thing that comes across very powerfully is, is this need for leadership in these challenges to actually make these decisions, these tough decisions about how to go forward. And clearly, all your institutions have been incredibly productive as well in, in these in facing these challenges. OK, so just moving on a little bit further then into this sort of what we call describing this hybrid way of working, could you help me understand perhaps some of the things or new things that you adopted to to address that perhaps some new innovations as, as you say you know the, the audience is probably more receptive but i guess uh, it was quite a steep learning curve to kind of to kind of re-engineer um particularly around you know where you've made comments around around experiential learning as well how, how does that really work so perhaps you could um take us forward into your journey into how you met those challenges and and, and is that sort of hybrid way of working kind of, kind of now the new norm? Nigel, could you kick us off on that, please? Yeah. Yes, certainly. Uh, well, obviously in March 2020, uh, we were suddenly given you know, like 24 hours notice to say that we all had to go virtually. At that stage, uh, the undergrad students uh, had virtually completed their primary research. So the impact wasn't too great on them, except uh, the presentations couldn't be carried out in the normal way. However, Initially, we were going to say to the cohort of master's students who were due to uh, start consultancy projects in May uh, that, you know, wasn't going to be realistic. Well, we had about 60 master's students ready to on the module and they immediately pushed back very forcibly and said to us, well, this is one of the USPs why we came to your university and we particularly want to do a live client project. So, um, they actually challenged us more that we had to embrace it. So um, we actually did manage to run right from scratch uh, in May 2020, uh, 15 master's projects. And what we focused them all on was how to help businesses, particularly SMEs, to recover uh, from um, the impact of lockdown. And what we did was we tried to target different aspects. So for example, um, we looked at Cockermouth in Cumbria, which had had, you know, flooding disasters, which had meant businesses had had to vacate their premises for the best part of uh, more than a year. And how, what lessons could other businesses learn from that? So we did a number of projects around what were the challenges that SMEs and entrepreneurs were facing at that time. And, and we found that uh, it was actually surprisingly rewarding. Um, that we found that businesses who we thought might be reluctant to engage with us because they were too busy just trying to survive actually welcomed the support and were appreciative of being able to engage with our teams of students virtually because like uh, the rest of us they too were having to work remotely and get to grips with it if i turn my thoughts now to the lessons that we learned from the journey and in thinking about the hybrid model um, our reflections i feel are that the students adapted and clients as well adapted remarkably fast to it um, and we suddenly found that you know distance and location wasn't an issue uh, to the extent that it makes you feel that actually although we used to think of ourselves and predominantly serving uh, organizations in the northeast area of, of England we have actually now quite got the capabilities of you know supporting organizations far outside the northeast and even abroad uh, so so that's a real positive which we're now taking forward what are the negatives well the negatives um it was interesting that when we started this current academic year um and we really had fairly normal year this year in terms of face-to-face -face delivery and interactions the problem we actually found was that the students 
because the undergrad students who are coming to us now had had two years of COVID restrictions. So normally in the first semester, uh, when we're preparing them uh, before we let, let, let them loose on a client project, uh, we're preparing them. We normally you know, do a few activities to encourage them to mix with each other, to form their teams because they make teams across disciplines. Uh, and that was far more challenging this year. And I think this was due to the fact that the students hadn't actually had that social interaction uh, in years one and two. Uh, and the teams of uh, business clinic tutors had to take a more active role in you know, trying to encourage them to make teams. Whereas in normal non-pandemic times, as uh, students were rapidly forming teams. So, so that was a sort of an interesting negative um, that because that lack of sort of social engagement the students had had. Uh, taking it forward, how do we think uh, it's going forward? Um, it actually fits into a wider agenda that we did have funding from um, Business Basics, uh, which is Innovate UK and um, uh, Bayes, uh, Department of Business Energy, Energy and Industry Strategy. Uh, and that was to actually do uh, research on a proof of concept to see how far the concept of the business clinic could be rolled out to other universities. Um, in a digital format more, um, which would then not require them to invest as much capital uh, in, in physical buildings uh, that Northumbria has with the business clinic behind me in my picture. Uh, and as a result of that, uh, there was a how-to guide uh, produced and published in March 2020 uh, to help other universities up and down the country to do it. And since um, taking a lead in, uh, in experiential learning and business clinic work. Uh, the business clinic has actually advised six other UK universities, plus one in Australia, on how to go about um, implementing a business clinic experiential learning approach, or which might be appropriate for their organisation. So that's basically how Northumbria uh, has found the journey to date. Thank you, Nigel. That, that's that's really fascinating, actually, isn't it? Getting the I um, almost forgot you were dealing with students there, <laughs> and you reminded me again, of course. And you know, it's um, it's really fascinating, you know, how how they can either push you or or indeed not necessarily have the right um, skills around them to to pick up again. It, it, it's really interesting. Um, Tom, could you comment on that um, this hybrid way of working and your experience, please? Yeah. Yeah, for sure. And, and <clears throat> interestingly, I can relate to what Nigel was just saying in terms of the difficulties this year. I found this past academic year to be much more challenging than the previous year when we were online. Um, and part of it was due to the, uh, the socialization issues. Also, the fact that everyone was wearing masks that you know, made it more difficult to kind of get to know people and, and recognize people and build relationships in a classroom. Um, but look, on, on the positives in terms of the hybrid model, you know, when we were online last year, one of the things I said clearly to, to my own students is just because we're online doesn't mean standards drop. So let's be really clear here, you know, that we still have academic standards, we still have our own personal standards, you know, to meet. And what was really interesting was that the students just responded fantastically because, you know, that was, you know, that was the, the message going out from the beginning. And during lockdown, when students couldn't move beyond five kilometers of their house, you know, one of the classes of 32 students raised just under 32,000 euro for various charities, right? And, and organized all sorts of innovative activities and online activities to raise that money. So people, you know, young people do respond when encouraged and given the right environment. And the other positive I found about the on online learning was that I, I had speakers from all over the world, um, which is something that never happened previously because you know you were looking for people to come into the classroom. And suddenly I was having people from Singapore, from America, from all over Europe, right? I, I was having top quality people talk to the students and going, huh? How you, you know, how could you get that person? How could that happen? Now, obviously, they weren't going to fly to Dublin to do a half hour talk, right? But to come online, yeah, sure, I'll do that for you, Tom, no problem. And and so, you know, that's something that we've we've built into this year's activities and we'll continue to do going forward. But what I really want to do, because the focus here is on inclusive entrepreneurship, is to share with you 
a model that was developed by one of my PhD students and it was published in the book and you know I, allegedly I have a claim on it but but let's be honest right it was it was my PhD students work it was Emma O'Brien and our PhD was on community engagement um, by HEIs supporting enterprising behaviour within minority communities or disadvantaged communities. And as you can see here from the model, OK, so there's, there's three areas that are kind of intertwining. One is disadvantaged communities. The second is enterprising behaviour. Now, we use enterprising behaviour rather than entrepreneurship because it could lead to somebody you know, securing a job or, or developing their enterprising abilities that might you know, be of benefit to society or to social groups or community groups. It's not necessarily leading to, you know, to, to, to self-employment or to um, a new venture creation. And then the third element was um, HEI community engagement. So the question that, you know, that Emma was, was looking at was how do HEIs use community engagement, right? to support enterprise and behavior within disadvantaged communities. And obviously that has to be considered within the outer rings, which was entrepreneurial ecosystem and then higher education policy. So you know, that's going to be context driven, depending on which country one is, is based. And from Emma's review of the literature and then her own um, research, primary research, she identified you know, these seven topics in terms of being most critical um, towards supporting enterprise behaviour. There was issues like capacity building that was both internally within the university, but also capacity building in terms of the individual. And um, there was the tailoring, which we've talked about previously. There was the notion of partnership. Now, partnership in the past is, is something we've talked about where, you know, Universities go out and deliver their expertise to a particular audience, right? But we've moved past that. Okay, it's got about it's got to be about co-creation. It's got to be about being mutually beneficial. You know, we are not, you know, the masters, or, you know, of of you know, that know everything. It's got to be um, developed in in genuine partnership, where you know everyone is benefiting. And I think that's a, a mindset that hasn't fully changed yet. Um, for example, when I work on programs on people with disability or indeed with any of the programs, I won't stand in front of any group of people and say, I feel your pain. I, I empathize with you when clearly I don't, right? So that's why, you know, we, we work very closely uh, and, and co-create programs with people from within the communities. Um, and I think that's hugely important. The nature of institutional support is obviously critical and fortunately in TU Dublin uh, our, our, our three pillars are people, planet and partnerships uh, and so we're very much geared towards or, or, or you know focused upon um, the external environment and, and we're set up to, to support that. Um, context I mentioned earlier and, and then understanding and teaching and learning will be developing appropriate uh, content appropriate delivery mechanisms uh, for the, the communities with, with whom we work. So when we talk about the hybrid model, just so as we're clear, it, it, it's, it may be not appropriate for everyone. So for example, in the prisoner program that we're developing currently, you know, the use of online learning is not possible because within the prison system, most prisons don't allow the use of internet or online activity. So it's got to be in person. Okay. With the refugee um, community that we're working with, it's most likely that we will be going to um, you know, direct provision centres or other locations where refugees are generally, you know, might be might be gathered, because there could be issues around accessibility and transport, and all. so it's easier for us to go to them, you know, and deliver in person. Uh, but that's a model that we're, we're teasing out at the moment. Um, so in terms of hybrid, in terms of of you know, how we use that in the future, I, I think it, it's very much context dependent. Uh, but 
certainly this model we found extremely useful in our own uh, university in terms of helping us to understand how we might best work with uh, disadvantaged communities in terms of developing enterprising behaviour. Thank you, Tom. That's really fascinating. I, I was just reflecting uh, when I when we were in the lockdown, I kept challenging myself to quotes, have a good lockdown and be productive. And clearly your team and Emma have been very productive. And I think that framework might be something we want to refer to a little bit later on. Thank you. Um, Joanne, um, could you tell us a little bit about your experience in your institution and uh, and what happened with your your new new ways of working? OK, uh, I could just say that we were surprised and shocked uh, in terms of our, our student body. As I mentioned to you, we were completely face to face. None of the students really wanted to go online and they went kicking and screaming. That was in 2020. In 2022, they did not want to come back. They did not want to come back. And so it's been a real struggle. We, uh, we uh, did a soft uh, launch of of uh, coming back hybrid, uh, uh, sometimes uh, in the classroom, sometimes online. But there is also a reason for that reaction in our community. In our community, it had a high incidence of a uh, COVID uh, and a high incidence of the population not wanting to get vaccine. So those two combinations give rise to students understanding uh, that it is higher risk to be uh, face to face when so many students weren't vaccinated and uh, and, uh, and 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 the conditions uh, were uh, variable. And so I can tell you, colleagues, that I lost in one department two faculty members. Uh, uh, died uh, in the first year of COVID. I lost a student earlier this year in the School of Business to COVID. Just uh, just didn't show up to the classroom and the parents actually uh, called the, the faculty member and said, we have lost. So we are still experiencing loss in this environment. And I do believe that it ha has had an impact on uh, how we are able to operate both face-to-face -face and um, uh, hybrid. But also in the community, the economic impact of losing the students and the faculty and the staff coming every day uh, to the area has really caused an impact on the local entrepreneurs. And that's one of the reasons why the university is trying to find ways to help help the community revitalize by bringing back some of the economic activity uh, there. But I'm going to uh, switch and talk a little bit about our, our, our book, Sustainability in the Future of Work and Entrepreneurship for the Underserved, because it indeed speaks to the multiple voices around the world. We present global perspective from diverse voices on sustainability and the future of work uh, and entrepreneurship for the underserved. And I want to tell you a little bit about the foundation and the reason and our why for the work. Uh, our why for the work is we believe the future of work and entrepreneurship for the underserved is a struggle for humanity worldwide income inequity. That is the basis of our work. And you might say, well, uh, uh, in income inequity is mostly a developing country problem. Uh, right around 2018, we looked at data that came out of uh, the UN and the World Bank, I believe, and several others, where they normalized the data, and we could see that uh, the data across the world about the in Income inequity. And uh, while it is true in some of the uh, developing countries, in some of the uh, areas in Africa and Latin America, uh, the inequity is greater, but it is not. Uh, a, 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 a good situation in developed countries like the U.S. and the U.K. Uh, let me start for, with the, uh, in the Latin America and in Africa and parts of it, and let me say this slowly because people have told me I often talk fast and I have to slow it down when I'm talking about this kind of thing because I get passionate about it. It is our reason for being and doing this work. But the top 10 national income share, the top 10% of the population 
in Latin America, in Africa, in the darkest areas uh, of disparity, uh, the top 10 percent earn between 50 and 70 percent of the income. Now, what that means is that 90 percent of the population have to survive on that uh, the the remainder. Uh, and, and so, 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 so it, 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 that is in the in the darkest parts, and I use that metaphorically. Uh, but even where we look at areas. Uh, like the U.S. and USSR, UK is it a little bit better, but the UK, uh, the U.S. and USSR, 10% of the population is earning 50% of the income, which means that 90% of the population is trying to survive on 50% of the income. And that is the reason for this work. We are not saying that uh, entrepreneurs, and a lot of it has come from innovation and entrepreneurship, uh, and a lot of the wealth is new money that has been earned by you know some of those new uh, entrepreneurs entrepreneurs. We're not saying that they shouldn't have it. We're saying that there must be a better way to share a little bit of that money so that so that the that, so that we can sustain a better world. Um, and so there's some folks that say we want to get back to normal. Across the globe, normal wasn't good for the masses. OK, so we, we, we what we say is that we have to do better than what was normal. And um, and so so I, I told you that we did this book and, and this first book, and that came out of some of the commitment from the, the scholars and practitioners. And we talk about, you know, in the academy, we tend to be exclusive. But what we found was that a lot of the energy in this work was coming from practitioners and the industries. And if we could find a way to include those voices, we would have a much stronger presence and a much stronger advocacy in the work that we, we, we do. So uh, I, I will tell you, uh, you know, I won't talk much about the, the first book, but I will tell you in this one, the process was difficult for us what we had this vision and the publisher had come to us wanting to have more voices but uh having more voices outside of the canon that we normally operated in was a, a bigger lift so when we put out our call for chapters that's how we did it uh, with this we thought we might get a few uh papers of interest you know uh, uh we were contracted by the publisher to produce at least 15 chapters. When we put out our call for papers globally, we had almost 70 abstracts, uh, 70 abstracts. And so we weren't worried. We said, well, OK, when the chapters come in, it'll be a lot fewer chapters. Well, almost 50 full chapters came in. <laughs> and, 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 and the content, colleagues, was excellent. We, we truly had a difficult challenge. Every chapter had to be reviewed by uh, at least two peer reviewers. We initially, because we didn't, uh, we underestimated the demand, we initially had about 25 reviewers. We had to increase our reviewers, our peer reviews, to almost 70 just to be able to cover the peer review process. And then uh, our peer reviewers, you know, most of them came in and need some re re uh, 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 revision, but the content was strong in what we were looking for, in inclusion. And they had inclusion about the women, inclusion about the minorities, inclusion about those with disability, several, several submissions. So we had diversity in office, we had diversity in content, we had diversity in geographic. Uh, and our, our, our uh, publisher rated us one of the highest in geographic diversity. And why was that important to us? Because issues and challenge, uh, challenges as they go through the Palestine might be different from Brooklyn, might be different from the UK, might be different from uh, Kenya, uh, Tanzania. And, and so we wanted to have a geographic diversity uh, uh, as well. And they rated us very highly uh, in that. Uh, and I mentioned that our uh, editorial boards, we had to uh, increase. And we were on a timeline because the publisher, the way they do it in the US is once they publish 
a copyright date. It has to go in before the next copyright date. So our copyright date was in 2022, and that put a pressure on us uh, to, to have the work done by the authors uh, before because we had so much content. And so, uh, you know, what we have done, though, and what the publishers offered us uh, offered to us is instead of just doing one volume, is to do two volumes uh, and uh, volume one, and we, we still have yet to categorize the, 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 uh, the content, all of the content, and I will share with you some of the topics. But uh, the, uh, once we decide what the categories are, then we will arrange it into volume one and volume two. And I share this with you to let you know how many voices are out there waiting to be included. And, 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 it, and, it, and it's, we didn't do the the the, um, the review pro process. Well, are you a scholar in the or are you a practitioner? We looked for good content. We looked for good content, and so. Uh, I, I will I will tell you, and it, it, it was a much harder job than the first uh, doing the first book. The second, this second process has been much harder uh, because of the diversity across so many different platforms. Let me just give you an idea of some of the topics. I won't give you titles because uh, we are still in in the process and notifying the uh, the authors of where they will fit in. But the, the topics included Black women. Now, let me tell you why Black women are important. In the U.S., the fastest growing population of entrepreneurs are Black women. And why? Because as they are in these corporations and they rise up, they hit the glass ceiling. They have done everything they're supposed to do. And still, they can't get into that CEO office or that C-level office. And so what do these smart, bright women do, young and old? They go out and create organizations and jobs for themselves and, and, and others. And so that is a very big topic that several, uh, we had several submissions on that. Uh, we had s submissions on the ecosystem approaches. You can't just develop an entity and expect it to survive without additional support around it. And it's not just about the money. A lot of times people will put money and put money in it's also about the intellectual capital of how do you do business, you know, and, and and it's about continuous learning. And okay, once you've hit the first level of running your business, you need support and mentorship to take it to another level. You can't just drop them. So it, we, we need circular ecosystem approaches and education and training, digital equity. You know, in our community, a lot of our community, the community of Brooklyn and those we serve, there is an equity and who has access to this digital platform. And I will tell you, colleagues, I saw this maybe 20 years ago when I was back at Hampton University, and we were on the very first beginning systems of Blackboard. We saw that the digital platform for entrepreneurs is a level playing field. Why? They don't know if you're Black. They don't know if you're a woman. They don't know if you're, uh, 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 you have a disability. All they want is the goods and services. They're willing to pay for it. And you deliver that and you are able to create opportunity for yourself and those around you. So this digital access issue is a big one. And the digital transformation is big. You can't transform digitally if you have if you have no access. You know, so, so I, I, you know I, don't, I, I don't understand why people can't say, uh, see why we say giving everyone the same thing. I heard it earlier. Uh, uh, it makes it equal. It doesn't. We start off in equal, uh, unequal. So, so we have to rectify some of that. And when you get to a certain level, yes, financial capital access is important. But you need to understand uh, other issues besides just capital access. We, they, they, there is a couple of submissions on the gig economy, global income and disparity, disparity. I talked about that. The green economy, inclusivity for people with disabilities. Uh, there were many chapters on that. And that was surprising because 
previously in a previous book, we didn't have that 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 many uh, submissions on that topic. Innovation, leadership, empathy, and inclusion. And I was so appreciative of Thomas when he said, I don't stand up in front of an audience and say, I feel your pain. Thank you, Thomas, for that. Because some of these places where they come from, the poverty is so great. I mean, we were visiting in Kenya where, where they had the, one of the largest slums in the world. And even some of my colleagues from the university would not go with us into those slums. We had to have an entrepreneur who had came from that. He was an orphan and he said, I want you to see how different it is for me to be where I am and where I started. And so we went through and saw the poverty. And I can't even say to, 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 the, to that young man, and he was a young man and now he's in parliament. I couldn't even say, I feel your pain. I can't imagine what it was like to grow up like that and get the skills to become an entrepreneur and to be successful. And he's one of the leaders of youth entrepreneurship in Nairobi because he believes that if he creates jobs for the youth, they in turn can create jobs for others. And then there was pace of technology, you know, that is driving a lot of the innovation and the change and race neutral policies, racism, that's always there. Uh, and it talks about how we need to try and and find ways to overcome some of the racism. Social inclusion, starting and growing black businesses, supply chain, sustainability is big now because we are able to create many businesses, but many of the businesses that start, in fact, the majority of businesses that start uh, uh, are not sustained. I, I think I might be going over my time. And so, uh, <laughs> I will. I will stop here. <laughs> yeah, I put myself on a timer. You know how much time you have for me. Okay, I will stop. <laughs> Thank you, Joanne. Joanne, I don't. Um, if you, um, I think we might. Um, we might one day need a new prime minister over here. So please, please apply for the job. Okay. <laughs> um, Joanne, another passionate um, pitch there. And uh, what what can I say? You, I feel as though I'm, as I say, with you in the room there. So thank you. Um, I'm just going to have a quick aside to, to Jacqueline, because I think given the time we've got um, and we've got some questions that have come in, I think we should perhaps just move the discussion on. And I know Burbick College as well are very keen to uh, get onto this issue around how, I, how what role does higher education institutions have in helping to power on, you know, the the uh, the support and the growth of inclusive entrepreneurship. There are also a couple of questions, Jacqueline, uh, that have come in, which are some very perhaps practical uh, points around that. OK, so Jacqueline, can I just ask you to um, decide uh, what is the next question, please, so that we can move on? Yeah. And Jacqueline, you're still on mute, unfortunately. Um, <laughs> Sorry, Jacqueline, you're still on mute. Yeah. I'm really sorry, it just keeps putting me back on mute. So yes, I, I'm agreed that we will combine the latter two questions, but also to give us time for participant questions as well, and for us to sum up at the end and, and call to action. So um, David, are you happy if I combine these two and shall I ask this latter, this latter combined question? Super. So it's very much what else can higher institutions his higher education institutions do and what role can they play to help create and support inclusive entrepreneurship within this new hybrid way of working and when you're answering could you also please just add in do you think that your reach and effectiveness has been enhanced by this new hybrid way of working so I know that's that's a lot for you to pull in and I'm I am really sorry we're going to I'm going to ask, um, first of all, I think we're going to ask, da, 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 da. I think we'll start with Tom, if that's OK. And we're going to keep you to um, probably three minutes each, if that's OK. Thank you. I think you're on mute, Tom. Yeah, this is a great question in terms of, of what roles Will universities play in the new hybrid ways of creating inclusive entrepreneurship? Um, and I think it's something that all universities need to be conscious of. As I mentioned earlier, 
I, I think there's a number of trends happening beyond the remote work and beyond the hybrid notion that are moving universities towards uh, this agenda anyway. And I think Emma's model is a good way of 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 you kind know, of addressing that. For me, in terms of what they need to do is is first recognize the variety of different communities and the distinctive challenges that these communities have. I would argue that you know when we look at what is being done, you know women is being addressed, immigrants in, in uh, being addressed. People with disability is increasingly being addressed, but a long, long way to go. But when I start to look at the other communities that we might consider, seniors as an example, okay, very little being done in this area. Uh, there's no tailored programs in Ireland, for example, uh, on on you know people, seniors, depending on the definition, but um, you know it generally would be viewed as over fifty. Um, and I read a BBC report actually um, from the UK not so long ago that somebody over 50 who becomes unemployed has only a one in 10 chance of becoming employed again. Like for for people to be on the scrap heap of, of job life uh, at that early, you know, that young age um, is, 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 is terrible, right? And, and yet all that experience and all that potential uh, I do know that in the US, it's one of the highest rates of uh, one of the groups with the highest rates of entrepreneurial activity. And, and again, it's it's an area that's been completely unaddressed in, 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 in Ireland and, and generally. Um, other communities would be the Roma community. Um, you know, a huge amount of work to be done there. Uh, refugees isn't, you know, is, you know, obviously with Ukraine and, you know, other situations. Um, that's into the forefront of the news these days. But again, all that experience, all that knowledge, uh, and you know, it, it's it's how do we solve this kind of you know economic problem? But you're kind of thinking, hang on a sec, there's 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 all this potential here. How can we tap into this, and how can we you know support people to to maximise their economic and social potential? Uh, marginalised youth. Okay, I would argue there's very little being done. Uh, in terms of self-employment uh, with regard to marginalised youth. Uh, universities are not places that marginalised youth see themselves going. Uh, so maybe, you know, do we we need to go to them? And then, you know, uh, prisoners is one I mentioned earlier, and, you know, indigenous communities uh, would be another example. So the point I'm making there is that um, it's that notion of, you know, a lot has been done but much more to much more to do, um, and I think that can only happen if we recognise that we need to move out. Have things changed? Absolutely, our reach and effectiveness definitely, but but not every community has equal access to IT or to broadband, as Joanne mentioned earlier. Fully agree with that, right? So it's not like like I saw with my kids in school, right? You know, the digital void opening up during online learning. OK, parents who were interested in their kids education sitting with them, while I know of others who were on PlayStation, right? Sorry, so sorry, yeah. Tom, please, I mean, yeah. please, please carry on. Put put some stuff in the chat as well. Please, you know, yeah. kind of, please, if you so look, just to wrap up. Like, 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 yeah. Thank yeah, you so just, so much. Yeah, so, and if I could then move on to just make sure because right, could I have Nigel, please? Thank you. Um, well, thinking about, um, you know, effectiveness and reach, uh, just briefly, uh, I think it has stimulated us to more proactively think about uh, trying to collaborate with uh, institutions overseas and trying to get students to work on a project uh, for a client involving um, students from two different universities in two different countries, because we've now seen that really the ability to work together remotely isn't actually uh, the challenge isn't that it because we've got the technology we can do that now but so it would be really good to be able to try and tackle something uh, which involves students from different cultures and different institutions uh, thinking about the question you said about what can higher education do i think probably there's a lot of good work that people don't know they're doing and i think it's important that probably all institutions uh, do some sort of audit 
and actually try and showcase examples because unless they promote their work to their communities in which they operate in, uh, people don't realise they're doing that work. And I do believe that it's a bit of a snowball effect that if, if you could actually show, well, this is what we're doing, other people will then approach you and say, can you do this for us? Uh, so I think if you could actually audit and showcase uh, and, and encourage uh, academics, I'm, I'm preaching to the converted in this room, but to be outward facing, uh, because it is about trying to think about research having impact in the community. Uh, so trying to be outward focusing. And then I think um, one of the barriers that I think everybody recognises is, is, is that universities aren't easy things to engage with. So I think we really need to look about as having a critical view on how welcoming are we to the external person. Um, and that's also accessibility. Now, I'm fortunate that the university invested in a separate building. That was partly because of space issues. But it means that when somebody comes to our front door, either myself or the business clinic manager or another member of staff or colleague can welcome them at the door. Whereas for most universities, they'll probably walk in and the university is designed for students and staff who are familiar with where people are. Uh, and I think universities can be very off putting. So if you can break down those barriers of making it physically easier uh, for people to come into your premises, I think that will inevitably help to help us to address uh, inclusion and greater diversity. So thank you. Brilliant, Nigel. Well under time. Thank you so much. <laughs> and Joanne, please. OK, yeah, I'm putting my timer on again, so I will go <laughs> over. <laughs> I so apologize. Uh, do you think the reaching effectiveness? I think because of the cost of education uh, and some of the outcomes where our students uh, pay, uh, at least in the U.S., go into a lot of debt and still don't have the kinds of opportunities that they expect it. Uh, we have a challenge. We have a problem because we need to get more in sync with the industries that employ them. I can tell you Microsoft, Amazon, uh, IBM, the, the chief uh, HR officer said 50 percent of the positions they're looking for don't require a college degree. And the reason why is they, they're looking at what, how is the workforce of the future shaping and how can we do workforce development ourselves? I can tell you Amazon is literally doing six to eight week programs and, 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 and preparing cloud professionals specifically and not requiring a university degree. So I think that we need to bring our arms around what is really needed for the new professional, not what we did before, not how we prepared them before, but what do we need to work hand in hand with industry to prepare them for the jobs of the future and the jobs that are coming? You know, many of them still want that liberal arts education, but I will tell you, most of my students come to me because they want a better job. Most of my students are already working, but they want a better career and that's what they're looking for. And we need to be able to help deliver. So more work with industry is needed. And I am well under my time now. You are. Thank you. Thank you very much. Thank you. David, would you like to see if we've got time to take a couple of questions before we summarize the session? Yeah, I think so. Yeah, I mean, I think um, we might be able to do this actually. Um, Obviously, I'm working at King's and often questions do come up about collaboration and uh, ownership of IP and, and, and so on and so forth. OK, I, I just wondered and every every university of higher education institution seems to have their own policies around this. OK, um, so I'm just wondering um, if there's a little bit of I, I don't mind who takes this one, actually, but perhaps um, any any thoughts of best practices in this area, I think would be helpful and, and in particular you know, for for um, people to start opening up and sharing their their knowledge and, and, and IP and how that might work whilst getting the support from the uh, higher education institution. Any thoughts on that from anyone? But I just come in on that, if they because I think it's actually quite interesting to have it from a practitioner perspective, because I think this is where Joe's coming from. And then if the panelists could could um, maybe add to this. So from my experience, initially, this this was difficult. And I have had times in my um, collaborations where you've kind of thought, hang on a minute. <laughs> but what's made it work is is co-authoring. 
co-production. And when it's done on that basis, there is that equity, trust, integrity and recognition. And I think that's possibly what I've seen works really well. So I'd be interested to see what the panellists think on that. If I may um, start that discussion, because TU Dublin introduced a, a really innovative policy uh, some years ago where members of staff own their own intellectual property 100%. And so if you're working in science, engineering, technology and come up with wonderful innovations, you own that, even though it happened within the university system. And the reason that they offered that was to encourage top class researchers to come to, to TU Dublin, knowing that this was one of the benefits they were getting. And then through the technology transfer office that they were able to commercialize these ideas um, and they'd be more encouraged to commercialize them if they owned them completely. Now what's happening again within the university system is we're moving to the next stage with regard to how we work with external partners where the notion of co-creation and, and co-ownership is becoming much more the norm rather than in the, you know, the past when the university would have claimed all sorts of intellectual rights, um, including whatever lecture, lecture material I might have presented. Um, and that half my brain was owned by them. Um, that kind of notion is 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 is, is kind of history. Um, we're not there yet, right? So as we're clear, we're not there yet. We're and 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 I think particularly the efficiency of that model is open to question, in that it takes too long for industry, particularly, for agreement to be reached. Um, the process within the university system has got to go through so many different departments that you're kind of left going. Oh, look, is it worthwhile? Um, once we can make it more efficient, I think the the desired outcome will eventually happen. Um, we're headed in the right direction. It's just that it's not an efficient system just yet. I think um, I think that's a good answer, actually. And I, could I just try and move on to a second question then that's come in as we've got a little bit of time? Um, so we've got a question come in, which I guess a much more practical question, which is, uh, for working with SMEs that are with um, disabilities, have disabilities. Um, Nigel, you mentioned about accessibility in, in your new building and so on. Is it, is it possible um, you could describe how that kind of engagement works uh, or, or, or perhaps some practical points around that? Yeah, I mean, obviously, uh, like with any of our new buildings, we're all fully disabled access and that's been built into the design of the business clinic. And we've had disabled students working in quite effectively uh, on it. Um, and uh, of course, the term disability, um, some disabilities aren't visual. Uh, and and we, we, we work with uh, a number of uh, clients who have various sorts of disabilities. Uh, and it's, it's useful for actually us to know about the disability because then it helps us to understand how their needs need to be addressed. But it also actually is a good education from the student's point of view for them to appreciate their diversity of the population um, and also to appreciate the, how these people uh, can make a very worthwhile contribution to society and have real strengths but they also are having uh, issues that they've got to manage and cope with. Uh, so every year we will have uh, some entrepreneurs who will have uh, disabilities and will be registered disabled um, and, and uh, we do work in also in things like in special schools we've done client projects and it's actually very good from a uh, young people's point of view to see how other people with, you know, maybe life problems, uh, to see how working on projects which will benefit their quality of life uh, helps. And it helps to bring, break down barriers uh, in wider society. David, if I can I come in on this one, because obviously I've just gone through a programme. Um, with that program, there were 20 participants and I, I said from the, the beginning that I did not expect 20 new businesses to come from it. It was an opportunity for people to evaluate their business idea and to evaluate if a sustainable business opportunity existed. It's not my view 
that it's beneficial to anyone to help them set up a business if it's not sustainable. And whatever community one comes from, you're supporting, you know, by kind of, as a colleague put it, by head, til head tilt and, oh, aren't they great? You know, it's nonsense. It's It's got to be, you know, a business idea has got to be sustainable or has the opportunity to be sustainable whichever community one comes from. And we got to have that honest conversation as well. Um, and, and some people don't respond to that in, in a positive way because maybe this is what they envisioned, you know, they envisioned that this is my my new career. But, uh, you know, on our program, we had some very difficult conversations with people where it was put to them that the business case wasn't strong. It was still their choice, right? It, it's still an individual's choice, but it was highlighted the business case was, you know, we believe was not sustainable and it would have come from different perspectives. And I think you have to be honest with those conversations. And if somebody chooses to go forward, then that's their choice. Um, but I'm not advocating for any, you know, for everyone that comes on my course saying, oh, we'll help you to start your business. No, will help you to evaluate the reality of the business opportunity. Thank you, Tom. Uh, David, are you okay to do the summation? And I'd like at the end, if I'd like to come back on Sharon's question, but I think I don't think we've got time at the moment. But if we we can at the end, I'll come back on that. I find it a challenge to summarise. There's so much content in here, but I think I mean personally, and I'm sure, I hope the audience as well has learned such a lot about. I mean, to Nigel's point, just what a great um, any amount of uh, content and, and product to the concept of entrepreneurship. And we've heard today about uh, lessons learned in, in terms of how higher education institutions have, have basically, to use Joanne's word, pivoted, you know, to try and address the challenges of lockdown and interesting ways of, uh, new ways of working. We've learned about the time of inclusive entrepreneurship is, is interesting. Uh, to Tom's point about uh, the, uh, the timing is good in terms of what's happening in universities, what's happening with technology and how this perhaps this new frameworks emerged, OK, that would, would help inform uh, how higher education institutions can engage with the communities and, and with inclusive entrepreneurs and with partnerships as well. Back to Joanne's point, you know, it's also about understanding, you know, what the, perhaps some of the big businesses are doing, businesses like Amazon or IBM, you know, they're also providing uh, training and input as well and looking at these particular programs. So it's really, really been a fascinating discussion and um, we've included in that, you know, the power of the enterprise, you know, for, for social mobility, you know, and creating a more, yeah, I think that's a really powerful thing and, you know, people and our people best of themselves and to actually, you know, uh, create great wealth, you know, create enterprise, great wealth in, in every sense social wealth, money wealth, okay, political wealth, okay, these are really powerful forces. And uh, it's great to hear what the higher education institutions are doing, you know, really activate that and support that. I think it's a really, really powerful and, and, and extremely exciting to hear about. But I've really enjoyed the discussion. I would like to thank uh, the panelists, all of you, for your, your very insightful and, and passionate contributions and uh, add back to you, Jacqueline, to uh, to close Thank the session. You. Thank, you. Thank you. Yes, I think um, obviously when we have an event like this, it's really important that we actually not only have our debate, but also that we actually go on to have a call to action. And it's been really interesting to listen today. And it's really has the more I've listened to the, the session today, the more I feel we really do need. And I'm kind of putting words into Helen's mouth here because I'm, it's probably going to be um, maybe Burbank that might lead on this or a combination of academic institutes around the world of the need for an international consortium on this because I'm hearing time and time again about the value of having that collection of data, collection of good practice etc and sharing things and growing globally and so for me, that's something that's really important that's come out from today. And, and again, just to echo David, really to say thank you to everybody, panellists and participants. Um, very quickly back to Sharon's question. It was about actually um, how universities can actually help somebody develop a product. So like in an innovation centre, but maybe that's something if, if you're all comfortable with, we could go back to 
sharing with answers to that as well. And I'd just hand over to Helen now. Thank you. Well, it's it's been very inspiring, um, particularly as in Birkbeck, we've just been awarded the Small Business Charter and taking up Nigel's point, we need to know what we're already doing in order to be able to build on it. And, and as Tom was pointing out, there are so many groups in society and it's what choices you can make with the resources and with the leadership potential and actual leadership there. There's so many exciting possibilities, but it's it's developing a strategy. Interesting that uh, Nigel's university is working with other universities, and I think that's a fantastic resource. And the fact that you're working with overseas universities, uh, and we started off with the timing is is, is so is ripe now for, for action. Mm. And so, as Jacqueline has said, an international consortium, a, a think tank, would be great. But it does require resources and it always comes back to what the university is going to do, whether it, it's the EU Dublin or Northumbria or whether it's uh, the university in, in New York. But where do those resources come from? How do you get those resources? And you can only do that by collaboration and telling the, the funders that you know what you're doing and you have the aspirations. But I do think this has been a fantastic debate. So thank you. Jacqueline and David uh, and Nigel, Thomas and Joanne, it's been brilliant. And thank you everybody for attending and thank you Isabel for making this all happen. So, so thank you everybody. Bye. Bye everyone, thank you so much. Bye. Bye.